Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. I'm exploring the woods on this cloudy, somewhat rainy, yet beautiful winter morning. And I'm here specifically to look for one wild mushroom. Now this is a mushroom that doesn't fit neatly into human created categories. It's considered to be edible, I've eaten it, and while it's not necessarily considered to be a popular edible mushroom here in North America, it is commonly eaten in many cultures around the world. This mushroom also has medicinal properties, including antioxidant, antibacterial, and anti-inflammatory properties. But this mushroom is also pathogenic, and it can seriously compromise the health of humans in a very strange way. It can grow inside and on the outside of human bodies and use various bodily parts as substrates for its growth, all at the expense of humans, of course. Now, if this sounds too strange to be true, I agree, it does sound very bizarre. But as you will soon learn, such a phenomenon is not as uncommon as you might think it is. There are dozens of reported cases of infection caused by this wild mushroom growing on or within human bodies. So which wild mushroom am I talking about? Well, it grows in these woods, so if we explore this area a little more, I'm sure we'll find it. So today is the perfect day to look for this wild mushroom. And I say that for two reasons. Number one, we're in the winter season here in the northeastern portion of the United States. And this mushroom tends to fruit prolifically during the winter season. Now you can pretty much find this mushroom all year round, but some of the best fruitings I've ever seen have been during the winter months. The second reason why today is a great day to look for this mushroom is because it's wet out here. It rained all day yesterday, it rained a little bit this morning, and this mushroom really expands in wet weather. It dehydrates very easily when it's dry outside, and it can stick around for weeks, maybe even months, in its dehydrated state, but once the rains return, it tends to plump back up. And I'm hanging out in an area with a lot of wood because this mushroom is a woody decomposer that grows on sticks and logs and stumps. So you want to look in woody areas for this mushroom. And of course, there's a lot of wood around me. And if I look more closely, I can see this infamous mushroom. So here it is all over this broken branch right here. You can see all these white mushrooms up and down this branch. There's some right here, and there's some right here as well. So which mushroom is this? Well, this is a mushroom known as the split gill schizophyllum commune. Schitz means split. Phylum refers to the gill-like structures on the underside of the cap. This is a very common mushroom that reportedly grows in over 150 countries and on every continent except Antarctica. The cap of this mushroom is hairy and it's typically white to gray to brownish in color. Now the underside of the cap is where you will see the distinctive fertile structures. These folds resemble the true gills that you would see on common gilled mushrooms. But you'll notice that the fertile structures of the split gill are actually split down the middle. This is a key feature of this fungus, and it's one that's very easy to observe when the mushroom is thoroughly rehydrated. And as I mentioned, the split gill is a very common decomposer of wood that grows year-round, though winter is especially a good time to find it. So what's all this talk about the split gill mushroom using the human body as a substrate and causing infection? Well, to shed some light on this fascinating topic, we have to go back to the year 1950 a year in which the first Peanuts comic strip was published, Tom Petty was born, and a gallon of gas, believe it or not, was only 27 cents. 1950 was also the year that the first case of the split gill mushroom colonizing a human body was documented in a scientific paper. The paper described a 33-year-old man who developed an itchy rash on the toes of both his feet. According to his doctor, the man's toenails had become necrotic stubs. The doctor scraped the man's toes. He found fungal material on the nails. And after culturing the scrapings in petri dishes, the doctor eventually observed split gill mushrooms fruiting from the nails. Now this paper was groundbreaking for two reasons. It was the first time that the split gill fungus was ever formally linked to a human infection, but it was also the first time that any mushroom forming fungus was ever documented as using the human body as a substrate for its growth and causing infection. Now obviously, numerous species of fungi can cause disease. Perhaps you've heard of Candida, Aspergillus, and Blastomyces. None of those fungi, however, produce 
mushroom fruiting bodies like the mushrooms that you would see out here in these woods. They belong to an entirely different taxonomic grouping of fungi. The split gill, on the other hand, does produce beautiful macroscopic fruiting bodies that we could see on logs and sticks and stumps. Now since 1950, dozens of studies have shown that the split gill fungus can colonize a human body, use it as a substrate, and cause infection. In the early 70s, researchers published a paper documenting the growth of the split gill fungus in the mouth of a four-month-old girl and causing an inflammatory mouth ulcer. Upon being treated with an antifungal medication, the girl's symptoms subsided and her health returned. In the 1990s, a 58-year-old man was admitted to the hospital for muscle weakness and for multiple lung and brain lesions. The doctors discovered that the split gill fungus had caused an initial lung infection that moved to his brain. And after taking samples for analysis, the doctors discovered that the split gill fungus was actually growing in the man's lungs and brain. Although the man was treated with medications, he died shortly thereafter. And more recently, just a few years ago, a 78-year-old man was admitted to the hospital for fever and for breathing problems. The doctors discovered that the split gill fungus had caused a serious infection and was growing in the man's lungs. Despite treatment, the patient soon died from an accumulation of pus in his lungs. Now I could go on and on and on with all the cases of a split gill fungus causing or being associated with infection in the human body. And to date, there have been over 90, 90 documented cases of this happening. The vast majority of cases involve the upper or lower respiratory tracts, but other cases involve meningitis, eye infections, and brain abscesses. Now it's important to note that infection caused by the split gill is almost always caused by the growth of little fungal strands known as hyphae, rather than the growth of actual mushroom fruiting bodies. So when doctors discover an infection caused by the split gill, they're detecting these fungal strands of hyphae rather than the actual mushroom fruiting bodies in human beings. Only when the doctors isolate fungal material and proceed to culture them in petri dishes or when they send the fungal material away for DNA analysis do they discover that the split gill was the main culprit implicated in the disease. Now there are many questions that, at this point in the video, remain unanswered. For example, why does the split gill cause infection in humans? And how exactly does it cause infection? How does it get in the body in the first place? Well, the most likely route of infection is through the inhalation of spores. Remember, the split gill is a very common mushroom. It's found all over the world. All these mushrooms produce lots of spores and subsequently lots of opportunities for people to either inhale the spores or have the spores land on their bodies. These spores are obviously quite tenacious and they can germinate on or inside human bodies and grow into thin hyphal strands, which can cause infection and disease in some individuals. Now, of course, the vast majority of people will never develop an infection caused by the split gill fungus. There's a good chance that all of us watching this video have inhaled split gill mushroom spores on multiple occasions and have never had this fungus colonize our lungs or our brains. Now certainly the risk of infection seems to be greater in immunocompromised people, but even among the immunocompromised, the risk of infection is relatively low. It's interesting to note, however, that in many of the cases reported in the scientific literature, people who were not immunocompromised came down with infection, and this anomaly was explicitly stated by the study's researchers. But when you dig a bit more deeply into the case histories of these patients, you soon realize that many of these people had underlying conditions, including hypertension, diabetes, allergies, and obesity. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that the split gill fungus is unique in that it's a mushroom-forming species that can grow in humans. And most other fungi that live and grow within humans, like Candida and Aspergillus, don't produce mushroom fruiting bodies ever. But as it turns out, the split gill is not the only mushroom-forming fungus that can grow in humans. Other examples include the mica cap, the smoky polypore, the patty straw mushroom, and the milk-white toothed polypore. Ultimately though, I don't think you need to worry too much about any of these fungi causing an infection in your body. Now it's true that infections are probably underreported, and according to researchers, many more cases of infection probably exist 
compared to what the scientific literature actually suggests. But when it comes to all of the threats that could ever compromise your health, including toxic food, toxic water, toxic thoughts, and toxic people, mushroom forming fungi whose hyphae can grow inside the human body are realistically probably pretty low in the list of threats. And as paradoxical as it sounds, especially after watching this video, ingesting mushrooms, either physically eating mushrooms or drinking mushrooms, is one way to build health and to maintain a functional immune system. So don't fear fungi, but learn and appreciate all the ways you can and must coexist with them. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to support this channel, there are a few ways you can do that. You can subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. You can also head on over to learnyourland.com and sign up for the email newsletter. And if you are on social media, you can give Learn Your Land a follow on Instagram and on Facebook. Thanks again for watching, I truly appreciate it. I'll see you on the next video.